our generation is probably the most innovative generations. We have so many ideas, so many, everyone's so entrepreneurial. I think from the ages of 14, 13, people wanted to start businesses. I think the third thing which helped me so much is and This is one of the biggest hacks, I will say. So my first deal took me about your generation, Gen Z, it's not 10%, it's not 40%, it's not 80%, that 98% of the Gen Z, you're the worst. Introducing Denzel Jones, a remarkable young entrepreneur who has already made significant strides in the business world at just 23 years old. As the founder of DJ Property Solutions, Denzel has successfully sourced over £10 million worth of property for high net worth clients across the UK. Driven by a passion to inspire young people, Denzel also founded the Gen Z Club, a networking platform that collaborates with prestigious organizations like Lloyds Bank, HSBC, and the BBC, helping young individuals transform their lives through mentorship and opportunities. Right now, my generation, everyone's an influencer, everyone's a seven-figure business owner. That's happening overnight through social media. The older generation, that's a little bit outdated, would you say? With me, I don't like that necessarily because I feel like a lot of people right now want to be entrepreneurship, self-employed. A lot of people make the mistake of is their business will achieve a lot of success and then it just breaks. One thing I always say is that life doesn't get easy. I don't really share this, but stuff like one of the biggest things I've seen as the biggest downfall for a lot of men around me, like whether it's my age or above, is women. Welcome back to Take a Seat. This is the number one channel for mindset and motivation. Today, we've got someone from the Gen Z Club. He's actually the co-founder. He's also sourced more than £10 million in property. And I want to know what makes this young man so influential. He's now on stages speaking in front of hundreds of people. What makes this guy tick? So please welcome Denzel Jones. Thank you so much for having me, bro. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on, bro. I've been trying to catch you for a little while. <laughs> yeah, I think we've been following each other for a while um, in the space. I've been seeing your content, love it a lot. So yeah, finally got to connect at the event last week. So yeah. Definitely. I, it's a bit weird, like we're from two different generations, but we're in the sort of same space. Yeah. You know, um, is there something you see from the older generation that's a little bit outdated, would you say? Do you know what? I, I, would, I would say yes to an extent. I think when, especially the way they approach business and life is more traditional. But I think I learn a lot more from the people of older generations than our generation. Because I think right now in my generation, everyone's an influencer, everyone's a seven-figure business owner. It's hard to kind of cut through who's real and who's not. I think when I, like I'm, for example, part of this mastermind, and I think the average age of people is around 35. So I'm at the youngest there, but just learning how they operate, how, because we have a lot of privilege, privileges as Gen Zs. So learning how they can like look at life a different way, I can always learn a lot from it. So yes, yeah, really, really good. What enables you to be in that room? with these older people and for you not to go, this is boring, like, this is, you know, you're talking about families, next generation, <laughs> like, I'm young, bruv, I'm 23 and I'm, I want to go out clubbing, pubbing, being out with my friends, drive this nice ride, you know, new tunes, tracks, music, like, what makes you go, no, actually, I need to be present for that bit? Yeah, because I... I'm a big believer that comfort's a cage, right? And I think it's very easy, especially when you're growing up, growing up in a background where not many people um, have had financial success, where when you do a little bit well, oh yeah, you're doing your thing. And and I think your ego would want you to just stay in that environment because everyone around you is praising you and saying you're the man. But with me, I don't like that necessarily because I feel like it will keep me stagnant. I, I like to be in rooms where I feel like I'm the dumbest or the brokest in comparison to everyone else. So in terms of masterminds, um, I'm always looking at, okay, cool, who's achieve what I want to achieve and how I can reverse engineer it. So one of the masterminds that I recently joined, um, it's basically helping people to scale and exit their companies. And I've seen a lot of success stories of people who have exited a company for 10 million, 20 million, 30 million. And again, all of these people are like 30 plus. But I said to myself, even though I'm not trying to exit, let's say this year, but maybe in a few years time, if I can now be in that environment right now, all the mistakes that I'm, I can potentially make, let me make them now, learn from the best in the game, and then build a company that way. So to, to join it, you have to apply, you have to hit like certain revenue targets and stuff. They do like an interview with you and then you have to pay for the mastermind as well. But it's it's absolutely life-changing because and the funny thing as well is, um, to go a bit off topic, I feel like with us Gen Zs, a lot of our businesses are service-based businesses, agencies, coaching programs, which is nothing wrong with that. But with this mastermind, it's the most traditional businesses. So for example, someone does drive throughs for McDonald's, someone does 
um, wooden doors and they're multi-million pound businesses. And the reason I like it is because I can apply the strategies from how they make the traditional business work to how I can apply it to my business. Because I think as well, um, when I started my business, I didn't really know much about HR, operations, legals, finance. And I think they dissect that to a T. So again, I'm now learning, okay, cool. I didn't have this contract in place. I didn't know about this operation and how I can now implement it to my business. So yeah, it's, it's, it's an amazing room to be in, to be fair. So yeah. Denzel, um, not to be negative, but that sounds like a lot of pain. <laughs> sounds like a lot of, I need to go through that hoop, learn this, learn that, re regulation, new departments. Why do you want to put yourself through that, bro? I, I think it's because you want to start with the end in mind. Because I think if you want to actually build a business that can actually operate without you, you need to have these things in place. But I think what a lot of people make a mistake of is their business will achieve a lot of success and then it just breaks. But if you can now be building, building... Cause so they have like a tier where it's like you need to have level one of all of this in place, level two, all this in place. So you find out that each level, I'm getting it, the foundation cemented. I know that I can now um, deal with if I need to hire five staff next month, I've got the right infrastructure. If I need to take on another 20 clients, I've got the right infrastructure. So just about, I guess, preventing potential breaks in the future. Why? Um, I think because of me, I, I like to plan. You know, I like to plan. I think, you know, if you, without a plan, you're planning to fail, as people say. So I think with me, I plan everything to a T. Like, so if I know I've got the right things in place, it makes my life a lot easier. And this kind of leads in with my discipline because I would say that like, no one ever believes this, but I'm actually a very lazy person. Like, if I could, I could just be in bed. Can I would say just in bed chilling because I don't like being too lazy, but I'm, I'm quite a lazy person. But if I have the right things in place, it can prevent me from being lazy. So for example, with my business, I know that, and because I'm a big believer of focus, I know that I'm really good at, for example, connecting people, sales and marketing. But when it comes to operations, legal, all the rest, I hate it. So if I can now build an infrastructure in place, I can now just focus on what I'm good at and bring more revenue to the business and all of the rest of the stuff can be more automated and systemized. So that's kind of like how I like to, to play as well. And that now allows me to diversify my, because um, obviously I've got a Gen Z club, property business. So now allows me to kind of focus on my specialty in each business and have the rest delegated. So yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the era that you're born in which is called the gen z and there's a statistic out there that a lot of people hit this um burnout have you heard of burnout yeah, yeah. and the statistic for your generation is not 10 percent. it's not 40 yeah. percent. it's not 80 percent it's not even 90%. There's a statistic out that 98% of the Gen Z era um, of people are hitting this burnout. There's a lot of employers out there who say you're the worst generation to employ. You're 50% less motivation than the rest of the workforce. Your ability to integrate and add ideas is a little bit, <laughs> a lot more reserved could be due to too much yeah, screen, screen time, time etc. Yeah. What do you say about that? Um, I think you've got to look at it two, um, two different ways and I think you can't generalise. I think, firstly, I think our generation is probably the most, most innovative generations. I think we have so many ideas. So many, everyone's so entrepreneurial. I think from the ages of 14, 13, people wanted them to start businesses. I think we have the ideas, but I think we just need to use it in the right in the right matter. So what I mean is, for example, a lot of people right now want to be entrepreneurship, self-employed. So the reason they may not be focused in the workplace is because that's not aligning with their goals. However, if it was to be in their own business, they'll be a lot more focused. So I think the first thing is, it's the right people but wrong environment. So like, you can't get an entrepreneur to necessarily perform the best in a working environment. Same way you might not be able to get a corporate um, person to be a great entrepreneur. So that's, that's the first thing. And I think the second thing, burnout, I think, is subjective. I, I think a lot of times when we say that we're burnout, um, we're not actually operating our full capacity. I think my generation is quite soft. Um, and that's kind of a controversial topic. But I think compared, if, if I compare to what my parents and my uncles, the hardships I've gone through, days I feel like down, I'm thinking, I'm just being a baby because like, this is nothing compared to them. Like, we have it a lot easier than they do. But I think what makes us feel burnt out is, I guess, social media. Because you now feel like, okay, cool, I'm putting 40 hours a week, but then someone's now in Dubai, staying at a five-star hotel, renting a Lamborghini. So I think a lot of our generation will feel like, I'm putting this 40 hours, I can't even do this and that, whereas someone is just starting a business and online. So I think comparison is one of the biggest reasons why people feel burnt out. Uh, but when you actually compare it to them operating at the maximum um, capacity, 
I don't think we're actually operating at our maximum capacity for us to actually feel burnt out. I just think it's more so how we've been programmed due to social media and stuff. Um, what, what's your perspective on it, would you say? I feel that the way that we see things are very, very different. Yeah. You know, when we think of pain, we think of going to the army. Yeah, We think of the days you didn't have heating, mm. you know, to keep your hands warm, you know someone's um you know not being in the pe best position in terms of financially there's actually a guy called um Wojciech, nick Wojciech. Mm. this guy had a, a lovely family history before he was born but when he was born he was born without any limbs no hands no feet and he still knows how to brush his teeth, you know. And uh, the point I'm trying to get to is when they done a study on this gentleman, he's quite famous as well. His father didn't feel sorry for him. Mm. That's the generation we come from. We don't feel sorry for each other. We don't say, oh, look, this is, this is your life. This is the card you're dealt with. What are we going to do about it? No pain, no pain. Let's go. <laughs> That's the generation we come from. Yeah. And nowadays, the way we see like what anxiety is, I think it's not even due down to your generation. It's the way our people get soft. Mm. I've heard a woman go to a 24-year-old, her son, and say to him, be careful, you know, don't do that. You might have a heart attack. Yeah. You're telling a young 24-year-old he's going to have a heart attack. He's watching all the screen time and being led to believe that I've got it, whatever it's being said by an adult, someone who's like my parent is telling me that. Of course, anxiety is coming over. So where is that line? You know, who do you believe? Who do you not? Are we communicating correctly? Because every generation does change, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, my granddad came from India in the 1940s. He adopted them ways until 1970s my mom told me when i came into the household it was like going back in time and i had to just stick through it but again she had that discipline that no that's my husband this is his family i want to make this work yeah a lot of women would run and yeah. go no nah, I'm, not, I'm not i'm not not sticking around why um and some of that discipline was even passed over to me until i went to other peers and you know because i went to the shop went to my house went to my uncle's house it was all this little community and it was like even hot school dinners was home dinners for me because yeah. it was on the next street. So I was conditioned and bubbled. So my pain threshold and a lot of people from my generation are a lot different. So if you can see from the same lens as me, when I see Gen Zs, I love you. I mean, this is why I've got you here because I was on a stage where in the past, not going too far back in the, in the past, I was actually having a lot of anxiety to speak in front of people that that the one we just done, we murked it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. one, we was all over it. Like yeah. we were ready. Yeah. Easy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Come on, easy work. But then I, I I looked up to you. I went, You're young. I could see, you know, you're very young and you just took everything in your stride. You know? Um, so there is a lot of differences in the different, you know, generations that we're born in. However, you seem like a little bit of a, an anomaly. Yeah. Um, you know, in terms of your resilience and what you're able to do, where you are, the rooms you want to sit in, the places you want to perform in, who you want to talk to, how you mentor and stuff. So what what do you think it makes you different? Yeah, I, I think there's a really, there's a famous saying that says, hard time creates strong men. Um, strong men create easy times. Easy times create um, weak men. I think that's why our generation is like that because I think the previous generation went through a lot of hard times. A lot of them, for example, my mum, my dad, they came from Africa to here when they was like 16. So they had to now, obviously they, they need the English language, but adopted a new society, live by themselves. And that created hard times, which could have created a lot of people an easy life. But I think where with our generation, because a lot of us have had, when I say an easy life, I'm not on about to say financially, but I mean in the sense of, if you want to search something, it's on Google. You want to go to hospital, it's available 24-7. Like we've got a lot of things on our doorstep. If you want to order food, it comes in 10 minutes. If you want to watch your favourite film, you have to go to cinema, just literally put it on Netflix. So that has made us a lot lazy. But I think where I am a bit different is because although I grew up in that generation, I went through a lot of struggle growing up. So again, my, my parents separated when I was younger, still close to both of them. However, naturally my mum being a single parent, 
we went through a lot of financial struggles. So similar to what you mentioned, stuff like, I don't really share this, but stuff like there was times where we wouldn't even have heating. We have to now use the kettle to, to just to shower or we will like not have, we had like the electric top up. So the electric might go off and we have no electric for like the whole night. All of these things, I think, created that resilience in me because I said to myself, this is not my going to be my situation forever. Like, And I think because I used to see my mum work two jobs, come back, take me to football, take my brother to football. I think the one time which kind of made a change is when my brother was a year above me. So um, it was easy for her to take us to school when I was at primary school because same school. But when I was in year six and he was in year seven, my mum would have to take me to school, take him to school, go to work, come back, go to work, drop him at football, drop me at football, while struggling and not even making much money. I think around that age group is when I said to myself, do you know what? I want to be the change that I want to see in my family, right? And and I've come from a really good family in terms of like, um, they're all very educated and stuff. I think just naturally, just through life struggles, certain things didn't plan out the way that we wanted it to financially. So I think that kind of made me resilient because I never got anything handed to me on a plate. Even like growing up in school, um, a lot of my peers came from wealthier homes. So for example, there were times there'd be school trips. I could never go on them. I, I didn't make an excuse. Or I got kicked out or I, was, I wasn't allowed to go on these trips. So I think that made me very resilient. And I think because I went through all of that, I went through bailiffs at the door, I went through all of these things. I said to myself, there's nothing that I can't handle in life. So I think that kind of instilled in me a drive to be like, okay, Denzel, you've grown up handling, obviously not severe compared to some people like in other parts of the world, but with quite severe conditions. So it's like, you can now use that pain to drive you to success. So I think that's what's been probably allowed me to be resilient, knowing that one, my reason why, um, I know that I'm not doing this for myself. I'm doing this to change my mom's situation, the rest of my family's situation. So times that I want to feel lazy and giving up, I'm like, I'm not just letting myself down, but I'm letting my mom down. I'm letting my siblings down. I'm letting everyone else down. And two, yeah, I think just me programming myself that Denzel, anything that you want in life, you've got to work hard for. And um, if you want your dream body, you've got to work hard for it. If you want to make money, you've got to work hard for it. So I think that's kind of what I've now used to be putting myself in, in the right rooms. So, yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Um, what stopped you from going a different route? You know, hey, life's against me. The world hates me. I, I even got basic human needs of Maslow hierarchy of, you know, f f food, heating, lighting, um, you know, single parent background. This world's not for me. I got to hustle. I got to make this alone. My brothers are on the streets or something like that, you know, thinking, yo, why don't I just take a, a, another route? Because, you know, this is what I'm dealt with anyway. Like some people go that route. So what made you go? No. Yeah. Really good question. And I think, what so two things to tackle this. So one thing I'll say is, I think I really could have gone down that route because I think, for example, the secondary school that I went to was a lot of people from low income households. So again, that school, all boys school, it was just fights, people getting into this, people doing whatever they're doing to get money. Um, but I think one thing I'm grateful with my family for is that they're very traditional and disciplined. So my dad, although I didn't live with him, I'll speak to him every day on the phone, see him most weekends. And he's always disciplining me, like telling me, Denzel, just remember, wherever you sow, you reap. Anything that you do now will come to you in the future. So that's number one. Number two, I had an older brother and older cousin. Well, still have, but yeah, have an older brother and older cousin. And I think my older cousin, again, he went through a lot, you know, in terms of like street life, all that stuff. So he's always advised me, Denzel, it's not worth it. Like you've got potential. So all that I've gone through, like I don't need to go through that. So he was always keeping me switched on and that kind of benefited me in school as well because you know when you have like an older brother and older cousin in school you won't get in much trouble because everyone knows who your cousin is and stuff so I think that helped me a lot um, and then I think it's just me me. the final thing I think is my mentor so I think at the age of 14 and again a lot of people I was around was doing whatever they was doing to, and I think it was always tempting to go down that route I wouldn't lie there was, there was times where I could have potentially got myself into it but then last minute I had that instinct saying no Denzel don't do that I remember I think yeah I met my mentor um, and I think that was a complete life changer, which I'm very grateful for because he's someone that taught me Denzel. All this stuff that people are doing for fast money and whatever, it's always going to come with consequences. But if you can now stick to something, and this is what I tell like, all people that talk to me and ask me for advice, if you can now stick at something for three to five years, all your effort into it, it's impossible not to be successful from it. He And I think he used the words impossible. It's impossible not to be successful from it. I think that day changed my life because I said to myself, look, I can do all what people around me are doing and get a few hundred pounds here and there. That's not sustainable. It could even lead to getting into beef, get into trouble, police, whatever. If I can now stick to five, three to five years of proper, proper grind, I know the rest of my life, I'll be good. So I remember from 15, 
um, I think I got my first part-time job. I was working with him, giving him, bringing him like deals and stuff. And he was teaching me about property. Um, Your first job? Yeah. So he, it wasn't my job, but he was, I was just more so, I went to his office offering him, okay, if I can make tea and coffee for you and help you bring landlord leads and stuff, can you teach me? And he was, he was mentoring me from there. Wow. And I think, I'm not sure if it was 15 or 16, but I got my first job at a shop and said called, do you know Blue Water? Yeah. And I was concierge. Um, I don't know how I got a job at 16 because I think you had to be a certain age. But yeah, I was doing that. And that was my first bit of money. And again, I was able to use that to help my family. Um, and then from there, he was. that's how I got opened up to the different business streams, which I now was able to start my business. But I think, yeah, that mentor, I think the word, it's impossible not to be successful if you stick to something for three to five years. It completely changed my life. And that's why I think a lot of people in our generation, we need that guidance. We just need that figure who's had that proven success. This guy was, I believe, a 60-year-old English man, multi-millionaire, driving Porsches, big houses. But I said to myself, no one around me has that. So if the one person around me has that, is telling me to do this, I've got to do it. And I think that's why I love mentorship. I love learning because why not learn from someone who's got what you want to achieve? You know, so. What did your parents think when you got a different influence outside of them? Good question. So funny enough, and I'm really grateful for my mum. Um, she actually, I found a mentor through him, through her story, because she's a bookkeeper. I saw, I'd be nosy one day, saw some accounts. I was like, mum, like, who's this guy with so many zeros? She's like, oh, it's a guy. And then I reached out to him and she put me in touch. But my mum, she's very much like me, very extroverted, very entrepreneurial driven. So she's a dental. Anything I want to do in life, even now, I always go to her for like certain decisions. I'm like, mum, like, what do you think? She always encourages me to do it. She's like, I guess... High risk. Whereas my dad, he's more like reserved, traditional African. No, I didn't do this right for you, this and that. So I think it was good because with me, I never take someone's word as Bible. What I do is I take different perspectives and add my own tweak to it. So I'm like to my mom, for example, oh, like, so he told me, you know, focus on this, this and this. What's, what's your perspective? And she'd be like, okay, it's good, but have you considered these consequences? So they, was, they were happy because they knew that the person was influencing me in the right way, but they knew that I wasn't someone I'll just say, if he said a jump, I'll jump. I'll also come to them to understand if it's actually the right thing for me to do. So yeah, it, it, it was quite good to be fair. Nice. And so when it came to working, so you've worked in Blue Water under con Congiers and I'm, I suppose when, when you're working in that sort of role, you've got to be quite professional, right? Yeah. And welcoming, you know, did, did that influence the way you carry yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think as well, um, and this is why I'm grateful because although certain things were a struggle growing up, I think a lot of things shaped me in my favour. So for example, a lot of people at 16 were having warehouse jobs and that was just manual work, very, very annoying. But with my job, I had to work coming a shirt and tie. So again, it was now prepping me for what I would now later on do in business. I would now have to stand at the desk, greet people, stand at the board, people skills. I was actually extroverted, but again, it was helping me learn how to speak properly, how to present myself. And because my dad's a suit man, like he, every... Like his his casual clothes is suit, so he's all like, now Denzel, get this suit, iron your shirt this way. And so again, all of these things was disciplining me in the right way. Um, little things like being on time to work was all building me, I guess, the right principles to now take on later in life. So yeah, I think with the job, I'm so happy I had that job rather than like an Amazon job. I've done Amazon as well, but I mean, that was my first job and I'm so happy that has helped me because it allowed me to, I guess, develop the people skills and become a man before I was actually a man, if that makes sense. So go out there, take a bus to work, make sure I've got my food made the night before. All these things, I ensure, it, it disciplined me a lot when it came to, yeah, how I conduct myself and stuff. So yeah, it was really useful. How about in terms of education? Mm. Did you carry on with first, further studies? Yeah, so um, secondary school, again, I wanted to be a footballer, but you know, the injuries happened, <laughs> so didn't didn't work out. But secondary school, I think, I'm trying to think what GC I got. I think I got like, I did decent. I did like I got like eleven A's to B's, A to C. Sorry, like range from different. Went to A, a level six form. Um, did A levels. Um, I think I got which subjects? I done sociology, business, and IT, which was a B tech. So I think sociology I got a B, business I actually got a C, and then IT I got distinction. So I did decent. Then again, that was when my business was starting to do all right. Then I remember um, I had this debate. So back to what I said about my influence uh, with my dad. So my mentor said to me, Denzel, to pursue property full time. By the time you're 21, you're going to be take off. But my dad, no, Denzel, go down university route, have that backup. If things might not go right, you have that in place. So I remember I had that decision. And, and actually, before I answer, what's your perspective on university? I actually want to know what's your perspective on university. <laughs> I know everyone has 
every generation has different, but I want to hear your perspective. So here's the thing, yeah. When I went to university, <laughs> yeah, it was because nobody else in my family had been to university. So I wanted that little badge of honor, like, hey, the people who make it in life as pharmacists, doctors, brain surgeons, they have a degree. So I'm going to go and get me a degree and I can work part time as well. Um, so, yeah, uh, at that stage, it was a very different sort of question. And I'll tell you why. Because I could work in a cash and carry and earn like 200, 250 a week or something. Mm. Um, Over four weeks, I've got a thousand pounds saved. Obviously, we don't save all of it. So over summer holidays, over them two, three (laughs) months, I would have had that thousand, 1500 saved. And that's how I paid for my university. Mm. So it was a lot. It was a very different investment back then. It was it was a lot of discipline and working hard, but paying eleven hundred pounds is very different to paying ten x that right now. We yeah, are paying course. ten thousand pound a year. So if that was back then, it would I think it would have been a scary thought saying ten thousand a year over three years, thirty thousand pounds. I'm gonna be that's a mortgage. Bro, yeah, you know course, what I mean. Yeah, yeah. And what am I trying to do? Well, I did accounting and finance, and I did all right, but. I mean, can you not do an AAT course, account yeah, technician yeah. course or something? So I think my decision would have been different back then, but I wanted that badge of honor. Uh, what did it teach me? It taught me to get together with people who it, we had more free time. Um, when we had a project together, if you didn't turn up, then, you know, the project would get a low mark. So you had to rely on other people. So teamwork and skills um, and also perseverance. Like even in the last year, things get really hard and tough and you think, did I just waste two years of my life of course, yeah. to quit at this hurdle? So it taught me more about the life skills rather than when I look at credit, debit, ledgers, <laughs> profit and loss. Yes, maybe it might help me with numbers in property, but I think it was a good decision back then. Knowing what I know now and where social media and the short courses that you can do online with the right, correct people... I think it would be a very, very different decision. Like, I wanted to do property. I just didn't know how, you know. And then I just thought, if I got a degree and I work somewhere, I'll save enough and I'll figure it out. Whereas now it's like, hey, come and learn property with me. Yes, you can work, learn, source, earn side hustle money, do that more. You're learning that space. The environment's so different right now. So now would be a little bit of a different decision, but... I feel that I want to hear it from you. Yeah. What, what, yeah. What so my, is. no, really good answer by the way. Um, but yeah, so my, my mentors advised me not to, to pursue it, but my dad was saying you should do it. So I think when everyone comes to me about what you want to do, if you should go to uni or not, I think my, my advice is if you want to go to university, understand what was your end goal and work backwards. So I said to myself, regardless of what I want to get into, I want to start my own business. So I know uni university might have been the right option, but I understood that I could meet a great network, people skills, and worst case scenario, because I'm born in August, I'll finish uni, I think, 20 or 21 years old. I'll have a degree. Yes, I'll have debt, but I'll have a good connection. So I went with university. And as you mentioned, although I did business management entrepreneurship, the learnings from that course wasn't, I wouldn't say it was necessarily impactful, especially because when you're in uni, you just do coursework with your friends. Like, if you're good at accounting, you do it for me. I do all this for you. But when I tell you the connections I meant and the way I grew as a person, incredible. So I think first way is connections, right? So even one of my companies i've got another rent to rent company that's one of my he's probably like my my right hand now one of my closest friends i met him university if i never went to university i've never met him a lot of people who i met in the space in property because i went to university in nottingham i said to myself let me network with everyone in nottingham so all the people in nottingham that you can think of that do property i put them on my network just for being there independence again growing up got my mum my grandma got half sisters so Again, I'm the baby of the family, so I could say I got a little bit babied. But again, being in university, I have to cook for myself, have to do this for myself, do my own washing. So I think all of these things that I did helped me to level up a lot quicker. And when I compare it with some of my friends and cousins who didn't go to university, I would say like, although they, they could be smarter than me, but in terms of like lifestyle and independence, I would say I'm a lot more advanced than them. Not because I'm anything special, but just because I've been to university. Like my friends who've been to uni and haven't, I think they've grown up a lot faster. You know, you're, you need them to learn how to also manage your money. Because again, I was never exposed to a lot of money. So when you get now get the student finance of thousands of pounds, do you now spend that on drip like everyone else is doing? Or do you now manage your money, make sure you're doing your meal preps, your this and that? So I think university, for anyone who's in that dilemma, understand what is it you're looking to gain from it. You know, if you're looking to gain the connections, the insights, and if you're doing like a valuable 
I guess, degree, and again, valuable subjective, I'll say go ahead and do for it. However, if you just feel like you just want to gain that practical... And again, I think times have changed a little bit from when I started to now, although it's only been about four years. I feel like back then, there was a lot of courses online, but it wasn't as predominant as it is now. Right now, every single YouTube video is a course, how to do this. So right now, it might have been a different decision because... I feel like everything that I would have needed or the networks and the networking events, you can find them everywhere right now. Back then, I think that's when like the 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 shoot was coming up. So I think, yeah, it just depends on the stage of life you are. But I think in terms of like listen, my children, when I have children in the future, I wouldn't force them to go to university. I think I'll just understand what their goals are and see, okay, cool. If this lands with your goals, go ahead. But if not, that's completely fine. But I think even if you don't go to university, I think the most important thing is to get real life experience. So whether it's you're working with someone who's operating at a firm, not necessarily a big corporate firm, but let's say someone who's like an SME and working alongside a CEO, getting that real life experience, putting yourself out there, going to networking events, then yeah, I think that can definitely outweigh the benefits of university. So yeah, I think it's just very subjective. Yeah, it, it's it's a double-edged sword, isn't it? You don't want to say don't do it or do it. There's certain professions out there that you do need to do that, you know, course, etc. If you want to become a doctor, a pharmacist, a surgeon, you'll have to know how to wire that person up. My nephew was supposed to go uni, very bright, got nines, got, you know, in Peterborough um, newspaper, he made it and everything. He didn't go to uni. Uh, his dad's a train driver and he's decided to become a train driver. And two years in, basically he was someone who was hosting and giving people their meals and stuff but on 30,000 he's took the whole initiative become a supervisor he's just turned 21 just last week and he's on 45 grand already and he goes um uncle look I've got this much saved already I want to enter the property markets but I'm still a little bit and I'm like you'll do it when you're right I'm here. I got you. You know what I mean. But I don't. You don't. You can't make somebody do something that they they don't want to or they on their risk spectrum. But he chose that route, and I'm like, actually, do you know what? You'll probably get a property. Like your friends will come out of uni and be paying uni debts. You're probably very close to getting your property and then growing your portfolio because once he's got something, he's very intelligent like that. So, yeah, as you say, there's double-edged swords when it comes to university, if it's right or wrong. And there is no right or wrong answer. It's just what's right for Perfect. you. Perfect. Exactly. Um, so tell me when you first started your first business and how did that come about? Because that, that can be very scary for, for people to go, I'm not relying on a company to give me my money now. This is my business and I'm in charge of everything. Everyone's asking me the questions. How do I fight and learn how to come out the other end winning, you know? Yeah, 100%. I think f first business, which wasn't really a business, but is what... So my cousin, again, was older in school and he used to make a lot of money in school. I was thinking, how are you making money? But what he'll do is he'll go to Asda, buy like 20 packs of cookies, 20 sweets, 20 drinks, sell it. And this guy was making hundreds of pounds a week. And again, back then, that was a lot of money. And he just be like, oh, here's 20 pounds, here's 20 pounds. I was thinking like, how are you making this money? He's like, bro, I'm literally selling school. So when he was in year 11 and left, it's like he passed on the business to me. So then I started now trying to do that. But obviously the only thing was in school, you don't have to do it. So you get caught and then it shut down operations and then we them to do it. But I think that was my first, first taste of like, oh, okay, okay, cool. You can literally just get something, upsell it and make some money, right? Then when I started my concierge job, I think around that time when I started my first business, which was dropshipping, Reason being is because although concierge, and again, at the time, I was getting paid about £8.50 an hour. And back then, all my friends were getting about £6. So I, I was <laughs> making good money, yeah, right? Top, top dollar, man. Top dollar. <laughs> but I think one thing about me is I always want more. And it's, it's good and a bad thing because it's good because it makes me inspirational. But at the same time, I'm never necessarily happy with where I am because I always know that I can do more, right? So it's like a double edged sword again. But I think with that, I was like, I'm, it's good, but I'm not have to take a 45-minute bus to Blue Water, spend a nine-hour shift, come back, I can't really chill, time to go out with my friends, I'm at work. So I said to myself, how can I make money outside of having to actually just be there? Because it's just basically a, like a a glorified, not even a glorified, but just like a, yeah, a glorified job to technically. It's not Amazon Warehouse, but it's, it's a similar type of thing, right? So that's why I got introduced to dropshipping. And again, that was just more so me, for those who don't know, you're getting products from like a wholesaler and you're selling it online. And again, that was all right. And I had that with one of my friends. But I think again with that, I noticed that you had to spend money to make money. You had to now buy products or you had to now buy ads. and all. This. I didn't really understand the model too well. But again, I saw a little bit of money from it, but nothing that was significant. But I think when I now got into my mentor, and this again, I, I tried to double into, I think, trading, I think, 
all of these different things. My mentor was like focus. And again, the thing I liked about my mentor and that generation, they just say stuff in one or two words and you understand it. He just said to me, Denzel, focus. And I think that's why I said, okay, cool, let me just go down the property. Because again, I said to myself, and this is my mentality even now. So same way I joined the mastermind, I said my end goal is to buy and sell businesses. Why not join the mastermind now? Teach me how to buy and sell businesses. So again, my goal was then, okay, cool, wherever path I go down, I want to buy property. So why not get into property now? So that's why I started my property business, right? And again, so with that, I knew that if I just bring him deals, he can start giving me fees and I can now have a business. And that's how I kind of found out about sourcing. So that was my, I would say, my first proper business, finding deals, bringing them to him or bringing them to other people, getting a fee. How did you know how to find deals and what you were looking at? Because to me, they're all houses. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, that one's on for sale. And it's, yeah, like, it looks nice. Yeah, but also deal. And, and that's a question I always get asked. And I would say, it's a good question because what a deal is to me is not a deal to you. I think a deal is subjective. It's based on the criteria that you're going against. So what I saw was a deal was based on the client criteria. If I knew that they wanted to buy a property which gives them a 20% return on their capital, that to me is a deal that I'll find. Now, another investor might not want that, but I know that's a deal for that client that's looking. So that's kind of what I did. And, and I guess reason ways and methods I found was, um, one, I'm, I'm a big consumer of, of knowledge. So every property book I was reading, Every property seminar I could see, I was going to property podcasts, property YouTube. And I think as well, I learned a lot from people. So again, I was going to networking events, meeting these guys who are doing big things. And I was introducing myself and then have calls with them. I reached out to people, LinkedIn, have calls with them and just getting different parts of knowledge and putting them in my book. But I think the main ways which my mentor taught me was to find people, not property. Biggest hack, because as you mentioned, if I go and write me or look on the street, there's so many properties, but not everyone there has a selling point or a pain point where you can now create a deal from. But if you now find people who, for example, I remember one of the best deals he did, I can't remember exact figures, but I think just for like the example's sake, let's say the property was worth 200K, but then they wanted to buy their dream home in, I think, Spain for about um, 300 No, I think it was 150K. They was getting so many offers, but it fell through. But he was like, look, I want to literally buy a house for you in Spain for 150k and then the comp the property deal was basically completed so essentially he basically gave him the 150 and he got the property for 50k discount and he said to me Denzel this is a big lesson when someone has a big pain point that's how you can now create a deal from it so when I was now actually trying to find deals for him I wasn't actually going on right moves and stuff I was actually just talking to people I know I was at church talking to people I was on at the time using gumtree talking to people even my shopkeeper, I always tell a story, I got a deal from literally my shopkeeper. I was on my property uniform, telling what I do, and I got a deal from that. So my main method at the start was just finding people in property. Or not necessarily in property, but people who have a property that need to sell it or rent it out. And that's how I was able to get my first, I guess, line of deals um, when it comes to property sourcing. So, yeah. Mm, I hear you. What's, you said um, you were going on to some resources such as books and property shows networking youtube can you share some of the yeah. books that you were reading yeah so property uh, magic by simon zucci that was good no money down property investing by i think kevin mcdonald and um, i think it was property investing for dummies by nicholas work i believe his name is events and you guys can go to them now as well and um, the pin networking events ppa networking events and i, I never forget um i think six long times so about 17 I was really trying to get involved in property. And this is where I think sacrifice is very important. I remember we had one of the biggest football matches of the sixth form, I think semi-final against our rivals. Now, I was like one of our main players, right? But, and we had a big fans, all my friends were coming to watch it. But I remember there was a, a Canary Wolf pin meeting that same day. So I remember I played, I think, 20 minutes. I left, got changed in the shower. Um, so I got changed in the changing rooms, had a shower, and went straight to Canary Wolf. And I think that event changed my life because, again, the people I met there just opened my mind as to what's possible. And I think this is one thing that's important, which I always tell people is, even when you meet people, it might not necessarily be that day they benefit you. But it's just that that connection or one thing that mates might say that'll just open your mind. So I think from that um, event, when you get life-changing pieces of advice, it just completely changed my perspective as to what's possible. So, yeah, that's, that's how it's helped me, to be fair. Wow. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. And so... You started deal sourcing. How long after did you do your first deal? So, so my, my, my first deal took me about, 
I think six to nine months. And this is what I tell mm. a lot of people as well, because it's very easy to think that's happening overnight through social media or you can just source a deal tomorrow. But yeah, six to nine months of pure grit, of pure hustle. Um, and eventually, because I had a lot of deals fall through and stuff, but that my first proper deal, should I say, because other deals are more so just me bringing it to my mentor or whatever. But the one I actually count myself, six months, and it was a two-bedroom apartment, I believe, in Milton Keynes. Um, it was a rent to service accommodation deal. But yeah, that that literally was... Because was, I think a few days before I actually got that deal, I was about to give up. I was like, do you know what, yeah, this isn't working. Let me just get a job. But I think when I saw that deal, I was like, well, okay, cool. This is a possible proof of concept. That's quite a long time to find your first deal. Um, obviously, I, I know that you're, you know, a little bit younger, growing your network, etc. And at that age, for having so many knockbacks, which a lot of people could see as failure, what kept you going? Mm. What kept you to say, I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to see, keep trying. Yeah, I, I think I knew it works, right? And I think it was just going back to what my mentor said to me. If no matter what field I go to, there's gonna be knockbacks, right? Every career I get into, there's gonna be knockbacks. But if properties what I want to end up with, why not just face all the knockbacks now? I was willing to not get results for three years, four years, knowing that the rest of my life I'll be good. So my mentality was, even if for the first year I don't make any money, the fact that I've built my network and I've learned the art of finding deals, I know by the time I'm 20 years old, 21 years old, my life's gonna change. And that's what happened. So I think what kept me going was just knowing the bigger picture. I wasn't focused on the now, the vanity metric of posting on social media, I've got the keys, I've got this. No, I just wanted to know and get experience. And there's a really good book I recommend called Go For No. And it just shows the emphasis of going for no. Like the more you go for no, the more you learn. I'm happy I didn't actually get a deal. If I got a deal within a month, I would not have valued deal source. I would not have valued the hustle. I would have thought this is an easy get rich quick scheme. But the fact that it took me six to nine months, I now learn scripts. And I, and I think... Like, I think mentoring is so good. Like, it's good to learn from mentors because, again, I had that first mentor, which helped me a lot with my mindset. But then I also got a second mentor who actually helped me more so with the business and sourcing strategy. He was a source that I was doing really well and I learned from him. And again, from learning from him, although I learned a lot from him, life-changing mentor, I think what I learned the most from was doing. Me having those six to nine months of rejections and I learned, okay, cool, especially because I'm young and in the industry, I've got to approach it this way. This is going to be the common rejections. So what I, one thing I recommend a lot, for example, the people that I work with mentees, is that any rejection that you get from a landlord or an agent, write them down. Because now, if you can now pile a list of 50 rejections, nothing's going to phase you. You can now be like, okay, cool, this is a common rejection and this is my common way of dealing with it. So that's what I was able to do from those 50 rejections. And I think your first is always the hardest. From that, sourcing deals a lot easier. So I think it's just about knowing that the bigger picture, knowing that the end term, the, sorry, the end goal in mind, that, that was the biggest thing. What areas do you source properties in? So when I started, I was, because I started a uni in um, Nottingham, I was mainly sourcing rent to SA deals in Nottingham and surrounding areas, Nottingham, Lincoln and stuff. Then I transitioned into more so rent to SA and rent to HMO. Then rent to SA, rent to HMO and buy to lets. But the buy to lets were in more so Liverpool, Manchester. Um, and then I think, I would say a year and a half ago-ish, um, or two years ago, I came across Alex Amozzi's book. Have you read 100 Million Offers? Mm. Oh. Alex Amozzi, you got, I recommend his books all the time to everyone. But he basically says, work with what he calls rich clients because they pay better and there's less time. So I said to myself, these rent to SA clients, they're causing me so much headache and I'm getting a 2K or 3K fee, which is still good money, but I was thinking the amount of, um, I guess, hassle they're causing me, it's not worth it. But I kind of repositioned that and said, okay, cool, if I actually now focus on the higher market, let's say, for example, selling a million pound property, I can now charge a 2% sourcing fee, which is a 20K fee. So instead of me having to, I think at the time my goal was 100K a year. So to make that from, I guess, 3K, I'd have to sell 33 deals. Whereas to make that from a million pound property, that's just five deals. So I said to myself, let me just target that market. So I think, yeah, about a year and a half ago, I started transitioning into that market and started to focus on sourcing high-end deals for clients looking. So the, the slogan I say is, um, focus on sourcing um, prop properties over the price of £1 million for high net individuals in prime central London. So that's like my main focus now. And that drives 80% of the business revenue. But then I still have 20% of the revenue from rent-to-rent -rent deals, which like my mentees and other people, my sourcing agents, source from my other clients. But my main focus goes with the high-end high deals. 
So I've got two questions here for you. First of all, I would just like you to explain the abbreviations because some of the audience don't oh, so, yeah, know what you're talking about. Yeah. And second of all, we're going to talk more about your millionaire clientele and they see you're a young gentleman and how that what all works out when they're going, you're, <laughs> yeah. you're going to find me a million pound deal or you have a book of properties or clients that you can match me with? Are you sure? Like, you know, getting that respect. So first of all, you were doing rent to rents Explain what rent to rent is. So rent to rent is essentially when you are renting the property. You have an agreement with the landlord where you pay the landlord a monthly rent, and then you can use it for either use. You can use it for social accommodation. You can use it for HMO. You can use it for social housing, or whatever. Now, the reason this benefits the landlord is because they get obviously the guaranteed rent, hassle free. They might have had problem tenants before, so you're paying their rent on time, and you're covering all the maintenance. And the goal is to give them the property in the same or better condition. Now, you're using your creative skills to now rent it out as a service accommodation, which is basically, if you guys see that short-term lets on Airbnb and, H, um, sorry, Airbnb and Booking.com, HMO, room-by-room room basis, or social housing, which are providers that work with the government. So that's like the abbreviations of that. Um, H, high enough individuals, is just basically people over a certain threshold of income or, I guess, net worth. And that's what the market that I focus on now when it comes to those type of sources. So, yeah. And how do you deal with that type of clientele? speaking the Queen's English, looking at central London, <laughs> yeah. high network, oil bankers, lawyers, and then they go, sorry, you're going to, you know, you barely look older now. Yeah. No, good question. And I think, and this is why I think everything in my life has actually helped me and shaped me the right way. So again, when I was at Concierge, I was talking to, I wouldn't say Blue Water isn't necessarily an affluent area, but people would become moving from affluent areas to Blue Water because there wasn't many shopping centres around. So again, I'm now used to dealing with customer complaints, talking to people of a certain wealth, of a certain race. So again, that was allowing me to have the people skills. Number two, everyone in my family is like suit people. So again, I actually were the person that was in suits. So again, I think one thing my dad used to say to me is be so great they can't discriminate. So I would come in suits, I would come on time, firm handshakes, all these little things that I would learn and then I think um, the two other ways is, number one, is being a man of my word, like building that brand. If I say I want to be here at this time, be here at this time. If I'm a, say I want to find you this deal, and I find it for you. So being a man of my word. I think the third thing which helped me so much is partnerships and referrals. And this is one of the biggest hacks, I will say. A lot of my generation, we think we have to do it by ourselves. We think that we have to be self-made. We have to make the money ourselves. But I would say that, why would you not rather... Would you rather make 100K by yourself or make a million with someone else? I don't want to make a million with someone else. So again, when I now went to that market, seems how I approach every business, who's doing it and what can I learn from? So again, all the people who I knew were doing it, the Daniel Daggers and stuff and a lot of their team, some of them were in my network. So I was reaching out to them, getting advice from them, all of that stuff. Now, on top of that, I was thinking, what people are working with my ideal clientele? And again, private jet brokers, fund managers, dog walkers, all of these things. So I said, how can I now put myself in that network? Because when people buy from you once, they're going to buy from you again. So I started reaching out to people who, for example, own a private jet brokerage. I said, look, this client has been working with you. They've been brokering their jets for you or whatever. Um, I've also got a service, which I think will be appealing to them, which will be a property service. Now, I'm happy to give you a split of commission on anything that comes through them. We could do doing um, a referral. And now, with that, I didn't have to sell myself because if, for example, they're now coming to me saying, so they're now coming to the client saying, look, You've done five years of business with us. You might want to diversify your investments. I've got a really good property guy here. Here's his website. Here's his testimonials. Let's put you in touch. That kind of like sold it for me. What I had to do was just, I guess, keep up on my promise. So that's kind of what got me into the um, industry. And then from there, it was just a referral game. I think the good thing about this game is once you do a good deal for someone or a good service, the referral game is amazing. And, that, and that's kind of like another thing. Um, it's the service that I'm providing because at this level, so when you're sourcing rent to rent deals, you're just competing with other sources. People that have gone on courses, on programs, trying to find deals. When you're at this level, and we call it a buyer's agent, you're now competing with the Savills, the Knight Franks, the family offices. So again, I said to myself, the two main ways I'm going to, I guess, have that personal touch or that USP is by one, having my character, make sure that I'm a likable person, that they have that great personal touch. I remember little things about them such as their daughter's birthday, all these things I would write down on my CRM to remember. I think the second thing is my service. So again, a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll just show the property and that's it. But we'll have like a pack, we'll make an experience. They're buying the experience. We'll show for them around when they come and view the properties. We'll actually provide a great experience where they're like, it's more of a concierge type feel. So 
even if someone else might be cheaper or more experienced, because of the character and what I'm offering them and the service, they're more likely to kind of work with us. So I think that's what helps you to kind of get that USP in that market, I would say. I love that. I think that's what we was on staying on stage as yeah. well. Like, don't try and do everything by yourself. Yeah, 100%. You know I, mean? I see you looking and nodding. Like, yeah. That was the point. No, was when, the when you're saying, I was thinking, oh, this guy's wise. Yeah. <laughs> wise mean, guy, yeah. Um, how important is it the way you look and present yourself? Um, because for a long time, I didn't really dress up a lot. I was just like, people got to accept me for who I am. Mm. And I'm a hardworking person. Don't judge me for the clothes I'm wearing sort of thing. Um, what is your uh, thinking process between like the way you look? Yeah, I, I, I think I think presentations, everything. I think you've got to dress how you want to be addressed, the famous saying. Now, there is different debates about this again. And I think that's how my generation has changed a lot. I think we've become a lot more rebels compared to the other generation. Because I think like now you'll see people at networking events in tracksuits, weddings in tracksuits, which again, that's not something that I would ever do. And I think it's because people are trying to be unique. But I think, yeah, I think definitely if you want to portray yourself in a certain way, it's good to become a lot more sophisticated. But interestingly enough, actually, I was having a discussion with one of my clients and they said that they hate people in suits. And this is a really wealthy guy. I think net worth about 10 million. I said to him, why? And he's like, he thinks people in suits are trying to do too much to impress. So I think society has changed a bit where, for example, now, as we are today, we might be wearing a suit but with a t-shirt yeah. instead of a suit with a shirt. Yeah. So, I think you still have that smart element, but you don't have to necessarily come on a podcast with a whole waistcoat and and a bow tie. But I think just yeah, no knowing knowing the environment, like I don't always wear suits. Like when I'm with my friends, I'm with track suits. When I'm at certain places, I might just wear like loafers and a polo shirt. But I think you gotta have different outfits for different occasions. I think you got to be able to know that, okay, cool. If I'm now meeting a high enough individual, even just out of respect, I'm gonna come in a suit, even if that's not what he likes. For next time, I can change it, but just out of respect. I'm showing him that I'm going to put on a good suit because I'm going to go out to him with a tracksuit. So I think, yes, it's very, very important. But what about yourself? So you said that you um, haven't always wore suits, right? So what made you change and how would you say that's been able to impact you? Or has people been able to take you more seriously from wearing suits, would you say? Definitely. Um, I, I hope this hasn't, this is not going to offend anybody, but we are sitting in the matrix. <laughs> yeah. You know, people have opinions straight yeah. away. The world doesn't care how you're thinking or how you're feeling. They're just going to judge you. Like, they've got a busy life. They've got to pay their bills. They've got family commitments. So when they look at you, they've got to make a decision in seconds. So it's, they, they're not they're not hearing the story in your head mm, that sure. I've come from McDonald's and I've worked in Barclays and now I'm going to make it. But don't judge me if, unless I've got a, a 500-pound blazer <laughs> on. But now I'm just like, no. Nah. The way I look is an investment. 100%. You know what I mean? I'm going to go and shop for a nice, like, you know, the day we spoke, I went and bought a blazer that day. I went and have a matching waistcoat and stuff. I love that. Yeah, brooch, I like, I like you that. Know, yeah, that little chain. And I was like, that's different. And I felt like a king when I walked in there because I'm like, I'm looking fresh. I'm looking clean. This is hugging me <laughs> tightly now. You know, I'm feeling good. No one's seen this one before. You know, like, it's changed my aura, my attitude. And it's not saying I'm better than anybody because I bought a blazer. It literally just gave me that feeling of that little comfort. I deserve this. And obviously, when I got home, I'll make sure I'll go and get it dry clean properly because i'm like this is my investment this when somebody goes oh he looks nice and clean he looks like you know he can look after himself if he can show that much love to himself he's ready to show love to other people and do good service and that's how my thinking has changed to say you know there's people in my family who have taught me just just be the way you are but i'm like well that was for your own business in maybe a corner shop yeah yeah we're in the property game this is the multi-million pound yeah. business baby do you know what i mean if you want to shake hands with the agent and say yeah this is a million pound i'm ready to complete on it he's gonna look up you up and down and saying am i gonna present your offer to my seller because it could ru ruin my reputation if your sell falls through and i've said no to these other people how do you get you need every single edge yeah you know and yeah there might be some people who say that yeah i think you're too smart or stuff but but I'm, he's definitely not going to think nothing negative yes, either. Better to be over just and under just. And exactly. I, I think to, to add on to that is a really good point because I think always one of the most things as well because I think when it comes to the way you dress, yes, it's going to now let people take you more seriously, but it's the way you feel. Like when you now, so, and this, this is, I think, one of the reasons because obviously I was young when I started property. So me now wearing suits made me feel like I can be in that room because I was now wearing a suit. I was saying to myself, okay, cool, do you know what? Yeah, I'm deserved to be here. Nice suit. 
people take me seriously. And and funny enough, I took um one of my friends to a networking event. I think it's like a year ago, and they actually came in like a tracksuit. I told him, bro, it's a suit thing. Now this guy, I'm telling you now, he's a very knowledgeable, intelligent guy. Yeah. Every single person at his event was just thinking, like, he's trying to talk to them. Goodbye. Uh, I've got to go. And that's because of the way he came. However, with myself, again, and that guy I would even say is more intelligent than me. Like, I'm I'm very open when people are more, whatever. Um, but everyone was more receptive to me just because of how I conducted myself. So that, that's one thing. And even in terms of investment, I love the word you use investment to yourself because I think your personal brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. So if people know you for the person that always comes correct, that always comes in a nice suit. Like, whenever I see you, I'm always thinking, okay, cool, this guy's sharp. This guy looks after himself. And I know that you'll look after my thing. So even myself... I um, invested recently, for example, in like Invisalign because I want to now, not to say my teeth are bad, but I wanted to make sure that it's the way I wanted to be because, again, all these little tweaks are going to now allow me to feel more confident and allow people to realise, okay, well, Denzel looks after his skin, he looks after his skin, he looks after his body. And, yeah, I, th- I, th- I think it's very, very crucial. So, yeah. Do you know what? This is like a copy and paste thing. <laughs> I did Invisalign a few years ago. I even put a metal bar because I'm like, when you talk to people, people, look, people can say this is shallow, but, I think people want to see well presented people. Hundred percent. You know, uh, they look at you and think, "I can't." There's, I can't chink his armor. Do you know what I mean? Like, he looks good. Even like down to, I'm nearly forty now. You know, I'm thirty eight. Oh really? And yeah, so I'm thirty eight, and I've, you know, my, my daughter's fifteen, my boys are eleven and ten. Mm. You know, very everything down to the minute detail. I still not go on diets. I'm still very present of oh, I want to get more leaner, I want to get more in shape, I want to make sure I ain't got a big gut ha- hanging out or just don't let myself go, you know, like I'll put the the nice serums that I need to, to keep my skin looking healthy, you know, and looking youthful and stuff because I think presentation is key. 100%. When people look at you and go, mm, yeah, it looks good. I want to do business with people like that in the room, even down to if your breath smells, like, you know, if you've got crooked teeth, is gaps like that you might not have bad breath but it's just places where food would just sit in you know what i mean like i do think like that who wants to be next to somebody like you know i hope no one's watching this but i had a cameraman the other day turn up i've done about 70 interviews and this guy was quite good and then he come near me and it was like a little bit of a whiff and i was like okay i i, I can manage that and then he started talking and i was like Bro, I don't care how good you are, bro. This ain't happening. This yeah. ain't the one. I need to be feeling vibes, energy if I'm going to record with you. 100%. So, yeah, guys at home, presentation is key. Dress properly, shower, bath, spray up. If no one's telling you, just make sure you're mindful and aware of these things because that could be 50% of your problem gone just there. 100%. You know what I'm saying? So, that's the key. I was going to say the last thing on that is also, I think, especially if you're selling something, right, like a service. I think I'm more likely to buy off someone in a suit than someone in a tracksuit. So I feel like even if, yeah, whatever business you have, let's say you want to raise finance and you want to make a video about raising finance and you're wearing a tracksuit, people are thinking, well, I'm going to give you finance. But if you're now presenting yourself well and you picture something, it's a lot. Like even anytime I bought a mastermind, it's because not only had the knowledge been useful, but it's because the way they conduct themselves, they carry themselves because people are from people. So we're buying into the person you are as well as the knowledge that you have as well. So yeah, I think it's so, so key, but nice so tell us where has this sort of led you you started doing these deals um you know and you started selling a couple and did you just get into this full time yeah so i'm i'm gonna probably get the numbers a little bit wrong in terms of the years but roughly so 2019 i started university and that's when i was sourcing deals then i got my first rent to essay that same um, my first year of uni. For yourself? Yeah, so myself, myself to take on. Um, I partnered up with my uncle because, again, didn't have the money at the time. Um, I had the knowledge and the time. He had the capital, went together, got the deal. Um, so got t- rent to rents with him. And then um, COVID happened. We're still sourcing. And then I shifted from concierge to Amazon Warehouse because, again, that was paying like £10 an hour. 12 hours shifts throughout lockdown. That was good. And I think when lockdown opened up, I was still sourcing, but again, it was still hot and cold. So I think I started, I think I was working Amazon, Contage and Timberland. I was shifting between the different ones. Um, then I started 2021. Again, the numbers might be a bit wrong. Started the Gen Z club. And again, so now I had a Gen Z club. Tell us about the Gen Z club. Yeah, so the Gen Z club was more so started because <laughs> I wanted to create an environment for people like myself to get inspired because I knew how much the impact that my mentor had on me. 
I knew that how a lot of my friends who again some of my friends or not even some of my friends but people that was around me were doing illegal things to make money I always said to myself because with me I always I guess give people grace I said to myself you know these are actually really intelligent people they just need to use the right vehicle so I said to myself how can I put the right opportunities in front of these people to now achieve that so I remember back when I was about 15 again I might have been 16 can't remember at the time um, my friend myself and my friend Poku Banks who I started the Gen Z Club with as well um, we had a network of young entrepreneurs we had a meet up in Stratford Starbucks I think like 20 30 people I was thinking this is something that we can run with then when the when lockdown happened we kind of brought that to clubhouse we're doing regular rooms for like six months man we were doing like rooms on different topics finance entrepreneurship we're getting like 80 people in rooms 90 people in rooms some rooms some weeks we'll have like literally no one in the room but we kept going then from there we built up quite a big following and then um, Poku obviously had quite a lot of following on social media already then we dropped an event in August of 2021, I believe. Um, and I was a networking event in London, 80 people. We did another one, I think, in January. That was like 120 people. And in 2022, we did an event every single year. Every single year on property, women women, business, women in business event, every single thing. And then from that business, we realised that it was a bit... And around that time, I think when I left my job, and I think I was full-time Gen Z and property. But from that time, um, I'm, I'm always on about how we can maximise the revenue, right? So if I, from that time, our money was just getting generated from B2C. It was just about people coming to an event and us making money. And again, transparency was probably making a few hundred pound profit per event. It wasn't a lot. And I said to, him, I said to us, okay, cool. How can we now maximize the value of the company? And we realized that's the B2B game. If you've got thousands of Gen Z's data, these corporate companies from can't target Gen Z. They don't know how to build that trust. They don't know what the latest trends are. So then we now started packaging an offer where we'll go to a company such as who are our clients now, Lloyds Bank, HSBC, the BBC, all these companies that, look, we've got access to over X amount of Gen Zs. We can now allow you to be the main sponsor of the event, which will now be, and again, this is back to the sales skills. There's no point pitching something to someone who understand their pain points. We know that their pain points were, I guess, diversity in, in talent and recruitment, how to attract Gen Zs, how to build trust. So we basically created a package that fulfilled all of those needs and charged a premium for it. And I wouldn't even say it's a premium because for them, for example, to recruit someone by themselves, they could might maybe pay five to 10K or however much. But we will now charge a certain amount for a package which will now allow them to be headline sponsors, have an email campaign um, and target the Gen Z. So that now became a B2B business where we now have, we still have our events, but we do less events now, but larger events. We have like conferences of let's say 500 people where we attract the Gen Zs, but then the companies pay us to access the Gen Zs and to get recruitment and all of that stuff. So that's kind of how the, the model works. And it kind of interwined because even in, I think it was 2023, we had a real estate conference in collaboration with my brand and we had like all of the speakers in the industry um, there and that was really really good as well so again it kind of like went in hand in hand so yeah we covered like trading entrepreneurship careers fairs all of that stuff um, so that's kind of how it worked yeah how do you start up a brand mm. oh, that's the thing that everybody looks at you and they know your colours they yeah. know what you're talking about they're attracted to it how, how do you start that up I think um, everything I do is start at the end of mind so I said okay cool what do I want this to be and I think my slogan was the Gen Z, the hub of opportunities. So again, that became my slogan, Gen Z Club, the hub of opportunities. So I think the first step is having your brand mission and your brand values. What is it that you want to do and who do you want to serve? And that kind of leads into the second thing is your target avatar. Who do you actually want to target? Like, is it, and be specific, like, okay, cool. If you're just saying young people, that's too specific. When we started, we wanted to um, attract people between the ages of 16 to 24 who were young Gen Zs from a Bain background. That was our main target initially. So it was very, very specific. So now we knew what they want to see. Number three, I think when it came to the colour, I think, funny enough, I searched on Google one day, what is the most unique but memorable colour? Something weird like that. And I think yellow came up. So we came up with the yellow. Um, and then for in terms of brand messaging, it's just more so, okay, cool. Because we were our target audience, we knew what we wanted to hear. So the content we put out, the people that we put in the rooms were just people that we were listening to anyway so yeah that's kind of like how we went about it wow okay and and how did you build this room up like what happens when you launch a flyer and the first time you do it and only one or five people turn up good question man so i, th I, th I think and this is what i think so two things that number one having a team is important because we all have different specialities so there's three of us co-founders me poke and austin i'll say austin was good at 
um, I guess, the marketing. Um, I was good at most of the operations integration. And then Pokey was more so like the missing piece because he had the big social following. He could put the connections together and build hype around it. So we, two, yeah, the first two events or three events, I say, sold out amazing, easy, because it was like the hype of it. But then we came up to a Helder block where I think there was one event. I believe this was an event in Loughborough, Brighton, New City. I think about 10 signups, 90 capacity venue. And we was like, damn, what are we going to do? But this is where it created us to be. Um, cause us to be innovative. Then what we did was, because I used to do email lists from my property business, we now created an email list, now building hype. We now bring sponsors, um, or should I say partner speakers, bring hype. So we got, you know, the E-Man effect. Um, he he, spo- he was, um, know, yeah. yeah, he was we the... We uni together. Oh, was it? Yeah, yeah, um, the same year, we both done the county. Small world. Yeah, yeah, so he was the host of one of our events. Again, that brought more publicity. And I think it was just mainly about doing that. So now our approach is this. We'll have a set date. So for example, we have another real estate event, I think in April, which obviously you'll, you'll be at now, now that we're cool. Um, and, and we'll have that set date in mind. And what we'll probably do is now we'll create like a waiting list. Okay, cool, guys, we've got an event coming up. Here's a waiting list. And this is what you guys can do for any business you have, whether it's a coaching program or whatever. This is like the strategy I'll go. So have a date in mind and clear what you're going to offer. Okay, cool, real estate conference. Now we'll put a fly out to our waiting list. But on the lead up to that, we'll be posting a lot of content about real estate, a lot of emails about real estate. Now, okay, guys, due to the high demand, we're hosting a real estate event. Um, it's going to be out on this date. Please click here to join the waiting list because when you now create that waiting list, people can't buy straight away, which can now program them to now buy it at the right time. Now you can be like, okay, cool. We've had over 500 of you sign up to the waiting list, but we've only, now only got 50 spaces available. First 50 tickets are released tomorrow. First come, first served. That will sell out straight away. And now you can now show it's been sold out. Again, proof of concept because people want to buy what other people have bought. So now looking like, okay, cool, guys, look, this has been sold out. Don't miss the next drop in two weeks' time. Again, build the hype up again. And, and, and then we'll have different tiers and you can now increase the prices. And that's kind of like how we do it now. And that's the same way I apply it to my dual sourcing business, right? Because I'll post loads of value, value, value. And they'll be like, guys, here are my latest deals. First come, first serve. There's over 5,000 of you on this list. Reserve the deal by texting the word deal. And when someone reserves the deal, guys, the deal sold out. Now, these guys know for next week, they've got to be on it because if not, the deal's going to go. So again, it's just about programming. I don't want to call the word programming. That sounds like you're controlling. But it's just about training your list or your clients to buy from you and to have the urges. Because people only buy from the desire to buy or I guess the fear of missing out. So you can try and trigger either one of those emotions through your email list and your marketing. How do you get your audience off one platform onto another? So, like, how do you get them off your Instagrams, TikToks, Facebooks onto another list that you're asking them to sign up for or come to my Discord channel, for example? Yeah. And people go, I don't even know how to use <laughs> Yeah, I think I think there's two ways. So I think the first way is using a lead magnet. So, for example, if, if it's, let's say, a coaching program, for example, I've got a, a program to help people scale their sourcing business, right? And one way I get emails is by like, I have like loads of free PDFs and loads of free content about how to, like the basics of scaling your sourcing business. But now to access that, you need to have your name and email. So once you sign up, you're now, you've got to tick the box to agree it. You can now be on my email list. That's that like number one, we're having a lead magnet. Um, now with the Gen Z Club, we use the events as our lead magnet. So anytime you sign up to an event, we can be like, okay, cool. For you to get further insights as to how you can grow your business, once you bought a ticket, tick the box to be added to our email list. So now, if we're now doing an event every single month, getting about 100 to 200 people, that's what, in a year over 2,000 people, and let's just say, I can't remember the exact metric, but let's just say 70% of people sign up, tick the box, we now have that amount of people on our email list. So again, that was what we was able to do. Now, I think the second way to do it is by building that authority in the marketplace. Like I feel like there's a lot of people that um, have a brand, but people would just leave that brand based on price. But well, my goal was always to have a brand so good that even if I was to increase my price, people would still buy from me. I think once you have the authority in the marketplace, whatever you say people do, that's why you see like a lot of, let's say at a scale, let's say people like Iman Gadzi, for example, if he was to release tomorrow a program on how to start a car business, he will sell out because he's built that authority where people have bought into him, not just his product and his service. They bought into him as a person. With the Gen Z Club, we built out a brand where if you now say to them, we've got a Telegram, we've got a Discord, we've got this, people buy it. Yes, there has been some times where it's not worked as well as we can do, 
again, that's when you just talk to your audience. Okay, cool. Why is it that you're not liking this event? Um, I think one of the events was, I believe, was it a um, web, was it a webinar that we had? I think it's a webinar we had. We didn't sell out as much as we wanted to. And it was like, oh, okay, cool, because webinars are old now. We prevent in-person events. So again, we now tweak that. And that's why talking to your customers is so important. You can understand, okay, cool, what actually works and what doesn't work. Because I think the mistake that we made initially was thinking that just because we're our target audience, we have all the answers. But we were very biased because we worked in the business. But when you now speak to 50 random people that's not actually in the business or who are on the fence, we can now understand, okay, cool, let's make this tweak. And this will allow our business to, I guess, push forward. So that's kind of like how we went about doing it, just analysing the data, asking the right questions and applying it to the business. Brilliant. I love yeah. that. How how do you get on stage and speak in front of all them people? Do you have you had any anxiety? Do you get scared? Do you feel threatened? You know, or is it something like a duck to water that you're just like, I'm getting up there and just give, give me the mic, I'm good. I should be asking you, man, because <laughs> the event the other day, you, you showed it, man. You showed it. Um I I think so and actually I'm an extroverted person, which helped me a lot. Um I think as well. When you know what you're doing is actually what you're doing and what you're talking about is what you're doing, sorry, you don't have to now worry about what you're saying, just more so how you're saying it. So because I now know that, okay, cool, I've been doing property, I've been doing sales, I've been doing business. So anything that I have to say is just like second nature to me. So what I need to work on is how I'm presenting myself, if I'm talking too fast, talking too slow. So I think I, my, my first few events, I did get very anxious, but I think because the Gen Z Club had done that over... You've probably done like over 30 events now. It's just through your experience. And I think that's one thing I say to everyone. It's like, experience is your best teacher. Like, if you guys put your 10,000 hours in, like, as my mentor said, it's impossible not to be successful at it. So I think with that, it was more so like me getting used to it. I think ways that I helped myself at the start were just prepping myself. I'll pray before I <laughs> go, on, <laughs> go on stage. Or, or one thing I'm grateful for a lot of my friends for is I'd have my friends dotted around the room. So if I'm now feeling nervous, I'll just look at one of my friends, people supporting me, family members, um, but I think as well as just like getting that reassurance that them don't know like what you're doing is changing my life so I think with the Gen Z Club the thing I love about it is that you go to the events and I think sometimes on social media you'll post content even myself till today I'll post content thinking oh this is a great clip that I'll get like 50 likes I'm thinking wow why is this not going well when someone message me at the Gen Z or see, see me at the Gen Z event be like Denzel well, that clip you posted changed my life so I think me now knowing that the value I'm providing is actually helping people it's even selfish of me not to share it so that's why now when I'm on stage, I know that if I can only impact one person, so if I only impact one person, that's going to change their life. So I think with me now, it's like, okay, cool. Let me just put my pride aside or ego aside or whatever it is, or my doubts aside, deliver what I know I can deliver on and just try and impact people as much as possible. That, that's because my, my, I guess my mindset is all about how much I can impact people. So yeah, that's how I did it. How, how was you able to overcome it? Because yeah, you're, you're, you're a really good speaker as well. Like on stage, I feel like as well, the way you conducted yourself on stage, where you own the stage or presence, when people were listening to you compared to the other speakers, should I say, I could see their eyes a lot more fixated on you. So how would you say you was able to overcome that? Well, I, this is the first bit of feedback on getting off anybody. So I didn't really know that, to be honest. But um, one of my friends who was in the audience as well, um, so for some reason, this time, I had no anxiety yeah. and I didn't prep at all because I was just like, I don't know, because it was a little bit of a younger audience. I was like, look, bro, you've been in property for 20 years. You have a 10 million property portfolio. You started in McDonald's just 17, 18 years ago, and you've made it here. There's a formula that you followed. Just speak your truth. Be honest. Just get up there and be honest and be truthful. And a lot of my stuff, I actually was answering some of the questions. I actually thought, I'm like, is anybody going to want to listen to this? Because yeah, I'm just going to be just so normal as if I'm talking to you or a group of friends. But it's just maybe a hundred so plus people in the room. And I was just like, don't worry about him. Then look, this is exactly what I did. And I think people feel the realness yeah i agree people don't hear what you say they feel what you say and they see and you can tell when somebody's trying to script something and yeah. go this number that number this number <laughs> who's gonna remember numbers you're up there for like 15 20 minutes people are gonna remember how you made them feel he knows how i feel i now want to go to his instagram and dm him and ask him more i want to speak to him after so i think it's exactly what you said let's stop being selfish and thinking about ourselves and how do we look? Because if there's one person in that audience that we could have helped, that's what it's all about. Yeah. And when you realise that, you think, 
I'm just going to be me because someone here is going to know, you know, that they're feeling that right now. And then they're like the transformation going, that person can take me through that transformation. So it is just being unselfish, doing what you need to, just to connect with the right person. Because how many times have we sat down next to a person and they're, oh, on social media, they're like this, on a podcast, they're like this, on a on a, on a day in the life, they're like this. And then you're sitting next to them in real life and it's like, this is dead. Yeah, yeah, 100%. You know, like, what's the point? Mm. What's the point of being fake, you know? So that's what I, I've just said. And I think I spoke to Ted's talks afterwards and he goes, and he high-fived me and he goes, smashed it as usual. I said, what do you mean as usual? And he goes, yeah, you do this all the time. I was like, I think I did it once in Manchester a year and a half ago. That, that was your second time doing it? That was my second time up on stage. But I've now got to a stage in my life that I don't care. I am who I am. I, I, I I'm what I am. I'm doing million pound deals in real life. I've just bought a pub, free flats. My portfolio has grown. I've personal properties, business properties, the cash flow. Yeah, it's not a hundred thousand a month, but it is thirty five thousand a month. That is a salary for what people earn in twelve months. Yeah. Never mind per month. I've got to stop and turn back and look in the mirror and go, no, bro, you You're done doing it. Well. Yeah, yeah, you done it. You was on four pound fifty nine in McDonald's at one point. You're on 35 bags a month. Like, my kid, who's 10 years old, plays the piano. He's GCSE level already. So forget me now. Yeah. My kids are doing inspirational stuff. The middle one might not be as ac- academic, but he can put a four 4,000 Lego set that takes a plus 18-year-old four days. He's 11. He does it in four hours. Yeah. Got to look at his skills. I can't say, no, you have to, you know, climb that tree same way as your brother does, but he, he's got better skills than you. Yeah. No, expose what he's good at. And that's when you're really realising, look, I'm changing lives now because I understand human behaviour and how do I get the best out of you and best out of them? We're all different and that's good. Just like you um, just said about the Gen Z club, you did it through collaboration. Yeah. You know, you're better at operations, someone's better with, you know, social media, etc. You corner the market so you're good, stronger together. Yeah. Um, and not everybody understand that. Not everybody has that, you know, walk, talk, life experience, you know. No, a hundred percent. And I wanted to ask you actually, so you done you done amazingly well. And how are you gonna I know see your kids are older now as well, but being successful, how are you going to train your children? I'm not sure if you went through hardship growing up or not, but regardless if you did or not, but how are you going to train your children to remain disciplined, to remain humble, to remain hardworking, despite having a dad that's got a 10 million pound portfolio? Like how, are you, how are you going to do that? Or how have you been doing that, should I ask? Sure. So, yeah, I did have a lot of hardship. I shared dad's clothes. I've got pictures where I'm wearing jumpers up to my knees going on a France trip, and everyone's going, yeah, that's a lassie. But why is it so big? It's like, well, that's the best jumper we got in the household that I'm wearing. Or oh, why is your fade like that? Well, my dad cut my hair, innit? Mm. You know, like I did come from that background, you know. But it was all about my dad trying to save money to invest into real estate himself and trying to get himself a better life and the family. So yeah, I recently done a vlog going to my very first house, stepping on the the, the paving stones and going. I never used to want to step on the lines because that would give me bad luck. Or I remember going to play football with Sam across in the park. You know, we'd say, yeah, I'd meet you there at six o'clock. And then we'd come home just to ring on the house phone to go back. Like, that was my life. So what changed? Well, what changed was when you start, like, secondary schools in a male predominated sort of school and next minute there's a hierarchy yeah. and you've got to pay your tax. Otherwise, you're getting a broken nose or you're getting spat out in the toilets, like, or you're getting it. And there was no other way. There was, you asked your dad for help and he would just be like, you sort it out yourself, son. And if you come home getting beaten up, you're going to get a beating from me too. Mm. That's how it was. You just had to fight. And you just think, whoa, I don't want to be at the bottom of that pecking order. So yes, my life is and was completely different to my kids, which makes me go, all three of them are costing me 60 grand a year now. Why? Because I've got them in private schooling. They're getting mass tuitions on a Saturday. They have piano lessons. Somebody comes around to do piano lessons with them. Their whole life structure is different. Yeah. But do they have to work hard? Yes. In the same way as me? No. Mm. Why am I going to put them to get five GCSEs of Cs like me? Or working in the places that I had to. They've got a better foundation. So what am I going to do with this set of skills? Well, I'm going to make them a better version of me. 
Why? Because what I'm doing at 37, 38 now, they're going to be doing at 18 to 22. Like they're going to be me at that age. And then I'm going to see what skyscrapers they're going to be building. Whether the one who's doing Lego is going to be architect, where the other one says, I just want to be like you, dad. I just want to be more articulate. He already knows that to use his left side of the brain and right side of the brain. Mm. You ask any of them, say Jaden or Sean or Suki, my daughter, uh, you ask any of them like, I need to borrow a hundred quid. <laughs> Uh, what am I getting? Mm. Yeah, it's like, uh, what do you want? What, 20%, 20 pound on top? Is that okay? Like, you know, so they're not, they're learning the hustle. Yeah, that's good. They know if I give you something, but I've got it, that's for a rainy day. Yeah. They don't quite know what a rainy day is, but they know, oh, if I have it, I might get something more for it. And it's, yeah. a, it's a thing. And Sean's a little bit of a spender. He can't wait to buy the next Lego set, but he's a different flamboyant guy. Like, why do I need this, dad? I'm going to help more people like this or yeah. help them. I'm like, well, at least it's triggering emotions. Now, I'm already teaching them that they need to put money aside. So they already know that. The other day I took them to Wagamama or something. Yeah. And we hadn't been out for a little while. And they were, the way they were scoffing food, it was like, not in a bad way, but someone who wasn't very privileged. And they're like, wow, I've never tasted that before. This is new. That's new. And I was like, I've actually restricted taking my family to certain places okay. because I want you to know how hard it is life. And look, there's a lot of diseases out there, cancers and, you know, people getting digestive issues or ulcers. And I'm like, I'm very mindful that I want to eat home food. Yeah, of course. You know, I want it home cooked whole food. You've got to be disciplined, but I'm also mindful that you've got to be human yeah. and you've got to go out and do certain things as well. So now I'm starting to take them to more interesting places. They're like, wow. And, and sometimes it breaks my heart looking at them going, you could probably buy the whole shop. You know what I mean? But I've restricted you. But the appreciation is, Dad, you're just the best. Yeah. And yeah. you just think, that's my biggest trophy right now, that I'm the best thing that in their mind right now at this time, I can write that in a book, that I'm the best thing that they, I must have done something, right? Yeah. So it's like creating scarcity in certain ways, but in a different way. They still have to have discipline. They still have to be up in my house at a certain time. They've, you know, we print timetables up and yeah, you finish school for 4.30, right? Hour break, um, boost education session. Okay, half an hour phone time. Okay, one hour family time, 7.30 to 8.30 before you shower and go to bed. Like, everything is rotated. Now, some people say that's really robotic, bro, but that's a bit too harsh. No, because they need to know routine. They've got to know I can go to school. I can do tuition. I can be on my phone. I can have family time. All of these things are important. Mm. But how many times do you come in from school and it's 6.30, you've just had something to munch and you're still in front of the TV yeah. and then it's 8, 9 o'clock already and you go, what a waste of a night. And then you go up in the morning and you go to school and you haven't even done your homework and there's a scrap piece of paper you're hold, held behind before uh, detention. Why does that happen? Yeah. It happens because you have no structure yeah, in your sure, life. Sure. You don't have discipline, boundaries. So psychologically, I'm training them to say, this will be your meeting. Yeah. When you have a meeting, you, 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 your deadline comes, then that will be your break time, your lunch time. I'm, 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 I'm keeping yeah. that structure. So it's not like they've gone wild and go, oh, my dad's... I, I said to them, you're not getting my money. Mm. You know what I mean? you got to earn your own money. I, I'm like, let, show me what skill you have. Show me what you want to become. Educate to a level where you think you've got something or train. Like, Sean's 11. He's got a YouTube channel with 400 subscribers. Yeah. It's a faceless channel. He likes his little memes and stuff. But I'm like, okay, even that, you got to do it at a certain time. But let me see what you got. Why am I going to stop you? Because he looks at me and goes, I don't want to see you on a be like you, Dad, on YouTube. But I want a YouTube because you've put the belief that you can, no, you do, can do it. Yeah, yeah. And he's 30 years younger than me. You know what I mean? So you think he's going to murk me. Like, you know what I mean? He's got the chance to be the next Mr. Beast. Yeah. You know, and never limit them. Always allow them, but also create boundaries that you must do what the system wants. You must do your education. You must be disciplined with all these other things. Family time is very important. We all block out Sundays now that we must be together just as a family. Tuitions are there. Pianos there. This, But family is just as important as education because what's the point is when they're 18 and you got son come here yeah, i'm here dad uh we ain't got much of a relationship we don't even sit in the same room we've got different things you've always been busy with work 
what good is work now when you're 50 year old you're getting millions in the bank but your children don't want to sit with you we have to be mindful of certain things so when we talk about lifestyle it isn't built overnight and it isn't built in one day and there's no handbook or magic formula and it's hard out there a lot of parents are working two two jobs mum's working dad's working single parents so but we do have to be mindful of we've bought someone else in this world how do we bring up good people that are going to change society going forward as well? Powerful. Sorry, that was a bit of a long No, answer. but it's powerful. They're really insightful. Yeah. Really but insightful. I like to explain it properly, you know, so that's what I'm thinking. Let me ask you a question. How do you, how does women fit into your life? You're a very good looking lad, very smartly dressed. You're doing well. I'm pretty sure there's a queue waiting for you. Do you know, how do you manage that sort of side? Yeah, I think um, when it comes to like when you were, I'll say like, 16 and you're kind of learning about girls and this and that i think yeah you're just young and whatever doing whatever um but i think one thing i've always noticed to myself is the times that that's been the case is the times i'm least distracted but times i'm settled down is when i'm most focused so in terms of women yeah i've, I've got some uh, like uh some that i'm with now and um we and with that it's like i just love to be more disciplined especially because um, they're on the same wavelength as me in terms of like got got her own business all that stuff as well so it allows me to us to stay focused because as, as you said we can have your time for seriousness but also your time for enjoyment as well so yeah I think I think it helps a lot because I think one of the biggest things I've seen as the biggest downfall for a lot of um, men around me like whether it's my age or above is women because again as you mentioned when you're younger you've achieved some sort of success there's a lot of women who are there available for you I think it's just about your choice to know, okay, cool, you can do that, but it's just going to maybe distract you or take you off route of your goals or can even potentially lead to something negative down the line. Whereas if that one person that you've got a good goal with, it now will allow you to be more disciplined or motivate you to build towards something bigger as well. So I think, yeah, that's how it's kind of helped me as well, I'd say. And, and what about, you know, before you met your partner, missus, girlfriend, um, how did you know the right person to align with? Because there's a lot of temptation out there, bro. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's loads of nice looking girls, but they might not be aligned. How do you fight your temptation to say, no, that's the kind of girl I'm going for when 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 loads of nice girls are approaching you and going, yeah, let's just get together, bro. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> do you know what it is, Jeff? I think it depends on the stage you're at because I think when, when you're like, I think younger, as you, as you mentioned, you, you're more, you're a lot more free. But I think with me, I think because I would say I grew up quickly, I would say like a lot of, I would say like a lot of my experiences were younger than others in terms of like just like going out, going parties, work stuff because I had older brothers, older cousins and stuff. So like by the time I was like in uni, I didn't really necessarily care about that stuff as much. Like uni, I was just in grammar, should I say. I must I didn't go out and stuff and all that stuff, which I did. But my focus was more so on the grad. Now in terms of like how to know if I was the right person, and I'm not an expert, but everything I do in life is so intentional. So, I remember like three years ago, I wrote down exactly what I want. Funny enough, my pastor actually told me this. Um, I don't think I've ever spoken about this online, but yeah, my pastor told me this, like, write exactly what you want in a woman from their family to their values to what they do for life to how you get along with their family to their beliefs to their faiths. And I think he gave me like six categories and told me to write 10 in each category. I did that. And so when I met um, um, my partner now, um, I think, yeah, literally, like, every single box, all the 60, every single thing, literally, she ticks, I think. From there, I kind of got that that confirmation that, like, okay, cool. And I'm a big believer of instinct as well. I think as well, when you... I think because, again, my generation, it's subjective, but I think the dating industry is, like, a lot of my friends who aren't in relationships, like, the dating industry is, like, crazy. So it's like, when, I, when you see what, like, people are like, and then you come across a good girl, you kind of know what's right for you and what's not right for you. So I think, yeah, I think that was my main thing. I was intentional. I think that's the same principle I think you should apply to every part of your life, whether it's your business or whatever. If, you, if you're intentional, it's okay, cool. For example, business partner, this is what I wanted to be like. This is what my previous experience to be like. I think anything in life you write down, you can get to it. Because even when I met her, I wasn't even looking for anyone. I was just doing my thing, whatever. But I think when you, I think the right person comes at the right time. And I think I'm happy it has because one thing I always tell my friends, for example, is the year, the year that, that I met her, like the year after, I think business revenue and everything tripled because again, I'm just more intentional, more focused. I'm not distracted by all of these, whatever. It's just like more so, I'm more focused and more intentional. So yeah, I think, but there's always debate because I know a lot of guys are like, oh, when you're young, marry like later and meet someone later, enjoy your life. But I think with me, it's like a lot of that stuff that used to 
enjoy, doesn't really enjoy me anymore. Re right now, I'm just more so future focused. So if I've met someone who I want to be with for the rest of my life, why not just settle down and lock in rather than just doing all the, the nonsense that you could be doing when you're younger. So yeah, I think it depends on the stage of life you're at, to be fair. Nice, nice. By the way, I really like your suit. Where'd you get it from? Thank you. Um, This one, I believe, actually, I'm not too sure. I got this one like one of, what, a year ago. I think it was from... If I'm not mistaken, Zara maybe. Zara, okay. Maybe Zara, yeah. Where do you get yours from? I think I think it depends on yeah, it depends on the suits. Sometimes I go from Zara. Um, so I think when I first started wearing suits, it was like River Island and Top Man because obviously I didn't have much budget. Then I went to Zara for my more casual suits. Now like I have like some tailors that I go to for certain suits as well. So yeah, it, it just depends. But yeah. Looking cool, bro. Looking cool. No, thank you, bro. Sometimes I go to like MNS. MNS do good. Oh, stuff MNS, as well. yeah, yeah. They do good. I work um, them. And I found a little, I live near Essex in Romford, near them areas. I was just literally looking for a suit, a certain type. Couldn't find it. I still couldn't find it in this little boutique, but he, had every, he just did blazers only. And I literally saw one with a waistcoat, the one we wore the other night. I was yeah. just like, this looks good. It was a couple of hundred quid, but it was yeah. just like, I just loved how quirky it was and how good it fit yeah. without no tailoring needed. So I was like, I got his number as well. I'm like, next time i got another event, I'll give you a, give a shout. ring. You know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? Like you want, when you get to a certain point, you just want ease. Mm. It's not about 50 quid anymore. It's just how easy can I access you? How do you're going to make something fit? You know me already. You're not going to try 50 jackets again. You're going to say, oh, he's a bit of a, a moody one. He likes it like this or he likes slim fit or whatever. He'll know what I'm looking for. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's better than going into m &S or Zara or some of these other places and zinging around for 20, 30 minutes that you don't have. Do you know what I mean? Because we just go, we just bloody got to get another deal done, innit? Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? 100%. I think as well, like, that's one thing I've noticed with, because again, I love learning from people, right? So with my wealthy clients, they pay for everything. Like, they've got person to do the cleaning in the house. They've got dog walkers. They've got um, anything you can think of that. <laughs> I think, because it's a rule that they said that they said that they have like a rule where they value their time as a certain hourly rate. So, for example, it might be like 10K per hour. So, any task that's above, underneath 10K per hour, they're outsourcing. And I used to think that that was so silly. I can't lie. But I'm at the same now with a lot of things because with me, it's like, if you can now spend that time that you'll be doing that task to generate more income, it will now free up your time a lot more. And I think that goes back to like the scarcity versus abundance of mindset. And it's, a, it's like a famous quote everyone says, why are you worrying about the three bucks Starbucks? Like the, well, three pound Starbucks, when you can now be focused on the high generating activities, get your Starbucks, but you're knowing you're going to now make more money. So I think, yeah, people pay for convenience and expertise. So that's why people use our sources, for example, because we know that we have the convenience and the expertise that they don't want to have. So, yeah, I think it's so crucial to pay for convenience, whether it's your suits tailored. And just going to experts, because I feel like, for example, someone like yourself, you're an expert at property, right? That's what you do in and out. And you've got a family as well. So you don't want to be spending time making certain decisions. So why not go to an expert that's a tailor when you get a car, a car expert? Because they're going to now make the decision for you due to the expertise and their 20, 30 years of experience where you can focus what you're good at, which is making money through property. So It just comes more about decision-making. You make We make decisions within a minute. Boom, 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 cool. Outsource it or not outsource it. And the thing that the new generation sometimes get confused by, they want that coffee. They want that jumper, that shirt, that, 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 that your quirkiness, but they don't want to work after. Mm. They got, I look good. I take a nice picture for Instagram. I get a couple of likes and then it's like, okay, I need to go and buy something else now. Oh, I'll have to stay home and then I might get a little bit depressed because I ain't got that much money. They're not going out to hustle. Yeah. That's the bit. People need to know you got to, you know, got to work hard, play hard. Mm. You can't just play hard and then not the other side. You know what I mean? You've got yeah. to do your thing for it and nothing's given on a plate. And at some point in your life, you will realise that whether you're a pretty girl at some point, you're like, yeah, these sugar daddies are here or uh, guys are taking me out for a nice meal and or he bought me a dress or something. At one point, everyone realizes that, hey, my value is going down. There's yeah. a new set of 20 year olds out there or, you know, um, people that, you know, what do I do now? And then to create them habits later on, as you know, it's so hard. So mm. you might as well create that. Imagine how much power, if you're good looking, you've got a quirky personality, you get a lot of attention why not have a really good business brain or uh, a motivation behind you and imagine the results you can get and, and who you're attracting at that stage as well.
Oh, man. You've been absolutely brilliant, Denzel. Honestly, um, it makes me want to stay in touch with you even more, you know, after this podcast. But if you just look straight into your camera, if there's anything final you'd like to say to the audience at home and then also let them know how they follow you. Yes, I think my final tip is just to remember, um, whatever period you're going through right now, so I'm not sure when this is coming up, but I feel like, especially towards the end of the year, that's when things start to get tougher. people. You start realising that you haven't hit your goals. But one thing I always say is that life doesn't get easier, you just get better. So I think if you're struggling to achieve what you want in life, you just got to remember, you need to become the type of person that can deal with these problems. A lot of times we're just one character change away from solving our final problem that we have. So just whatever you're doing right now, for example, it's in your business, if there's a struggle, observe what's going wrong, make the adequate changes and increase the volume. I feel like whatever you feel like you're doing, just know there's someone else that's doing it 10 times harder than you. So make sure that you're doubling down, you're staying consistent, you're getting the advice when you need to get the advice and you're staying consistent because I'm telling you now, everything will work out in the end as long as you just stay focused. Anything you do in life, if you can stay focused at it for three to five years, put your 10,000 hours in, you're going to achieve your results. So that's my advice for anyone in your business or in your life if you're currently going through something. Um, and if you want to get in touch with me, my main Instagram is underscore Denzel Jones. Um, if you want to come to you for property deals, djpropertysolutions.com. And if you want to um, start your own property sourcing journey, follow me on the DJPS Academy. Um, and we help people start and scale their own sourcing business as well. And lastly, again, the Gen Z Club having a real estate event um, next year, 2025 over 500 people sponsored by some of the biggest firms in the industry. So feel free to follow us on Instagram as well. And yeah, happy to help. But now, thank you so much for having me as a guest. It's been Absolutely. an amazing conversation. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. You, guys like you and people like you, you know, really make this podcast. We can't do it without, you know, fantastic guests. And it's been great to, you know, um, meet with you at the event and carry on that relationship. And that's it for today, guys. I hope you really enjoyed that episode. Someone from the Gen Z club in the house, he showed us how he's gone from the concierge service right to the top to doing million pound deals. So, before we end this one, make sure you smash the subscribe button. Leave Denzel a comment on anything that you want to know about and I'll make sure he gets it. And don't forget to share this with someone who really needs it. Peace.